everybody. So we're going to be starting in about two minutes. So if you guys can silence your phones, your pagers, whatever you got, just silence it. And uh, we're trying to get security moving as fast as possible to get everybody in here. So we're just going to be a few more minutes. But thank you all for coming. If everyone could stand and rise and move, remove your hats for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight, Neil McCabe of OANN News. Here you go. All right, thank you, everybody. Welcome to tonight's uh, Border Security Town Hall meeting live in Cincinnati. We're live on One America News and the Gateway Pundit. Let's, uh, let's make some noise so the people at home can hear you. The people are watching home. All right. So, all right. So, Jennifer introduced me before. Uh, my name is Neil McCabe. I'm a reporter at One America News. Jennifer later on is going to be taking questions from the audience, and uh, she'll be right over there, and uh, she'll be organizing that. 
but uh, first I just want to welcome everybody. We're here in Cincinnati to talk about border security, but of course now every town is a border town, and we're with Brian Kolfage, who's the founder of We Build the Wall, which is the group trying to fund... <laughs> Brian, tonight, obviously, we're going to talk about your plan to build the wall, but we're also going to talk about uh, the national security threat at the border. We're going to talk about the drug cartels and how they're smuggling this poisonous drugs into our communities. We're also going to talk about human trafficking. For, for those people who haven't heard the story, talk to me about that night a little before Christmas when you decided to, to get this thing running. How did it happen? Well, I think I was just fed up with the way our politicians were handling it. And... Uh... You know, I was just a common person like you guys, just sitting on my couch, pissed off. Uh, it didn't, Easy. <laughs> it, it, didn't, it didn't seem like our politicians were taking it serious. And for, for as long as I can remember, we've been promised border security, you know, ever since I was a, little, a young child. I mean, it goes back far. And we're always promised this, and they weren't following through. And I had enough of it, and I just thought maybe I could have a, an impact. And, uh, you know... You know, our generation's technology and internet and, you know, social media, GoFundMe. And I th <laughs> so you're in front of a computer. Yeah, just in front of a computer. And I thought, well, maybe I can have an impact. Maybe I could be the person to help bring this to light and make it a, a, a more of an importance. Because we all knew the vote was going down in the House and Senate uh, a, a couple days later. And it didn't seem like our, our border wall was going to get passed. And just like that, one day I created it. Um, I talked to some friends about it, and they're like, yeah, do it, do it, do it. And I did it and just sent it out to the media, and it instantly blew up. And uh, people like yourselves were the driving factor behind that. Uh, everyone started donating, and it just started evolving into something bigger. And it impacted our, our government. It got impacted their decisions, too, in, in, in the House that evening. Yeah, I, I can tell you that as someone who covers Capitol Hill for One American News, uh, the House Republicans actually got some backbone, and that's why they put the funding for the wall back in because of what they saw the action going on. Now, did you stay up at night when it was like, the numbers were sort of like tallying up? Did you just sort of watch the numbers move? I, I, I was so burnt out from the media, I wasn't even watching it. I watched a little bit and then, um, but yeah, I mean, one night, <laughs> or one morning, it was, it was the morning after the, the House voted to fund the wall and Representative Jim Jordan, who's, you know, Ohio. <laughs> uh, He, Jim Jordan was the first one to call me from our, United, from our government. He called me and thanked me, and he said that this GoFundMe directly impacted their vote, and that's why they voted that night to pass the wall funding in the House. So, we're going to... Uh... We're going to be bringing on some other people, Brian, to sort of keep this conversation going. Okay. But in the past, what, three months now, or two and a half months, what have you learned? What has surprised you? Sort of give, give people a feel of what you've been up to lately. Well, we've been down at the border every single day, just about. Our team has been down at the border. And we're educating ourselves on what's going on down there, because we're not border experts. We've, we've, we've built a team now of experts from all these different fields. And we're educating ourselves and coming out that we can educate communities of what's really going on. And we learned there's a big problem, a major problem, and bigger than I could even imagine. Uh, just one instance of this issue was when we were in Texas uh, about a month ago or a few weeks ago. In McAllen. In McAllen, Texas. And we went into this area where normally the public's not allowed. And if the media goes in there, they lock it down and they make sure no legals are coming across. Our expert, Brandon Darby, got us in this area where it's only government officials allowed. We went in there, within two minutes, we saw our first group of illegal aliens, 20 of them, 20 of them just strolling around, in, you know, wait, about a half a mile inside the U.S. Um, they came from Guatemala and Honduras. We talked to them for a little bit. We wanted to be found. 
No one was stopping them. They wanted to come across into the U.S. and be found by the Border Patrol. A couple minutes later, we drove up the road, another half mile, another 20 of them coming out of the bushes. And it was just, they're flowing in across the border. No one was stopping them. And it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous that they're just coming over here and abusing the system, staying asylum, getting benefits, and getting farmed out all over the U.S. I mean, that, that's just one problem. Yeah, I, I, th I think that uh, it really hit me then because you hear about uh, what it means to have the asylum, you know, they're, they're having the ability to apply for asylum, is that down there, the migrants chase Border Patrol. Right. Border Patrol does not chase the migrants. Yeah. And they ash actually asked us, uh, you know, where's Border Patrol? And we're like, oh, you find them down the road there. And they're like, okay, thanks. And yeah, it's crazy. It's just, it's, the system is completely broken. And, you know, that's, that's just the migrants. And then the, the drugs coming across is just, we, can, we, can, we don't even know what's coming across that border. We need to fix this. And uh, before we bring on uh, the, the first guest, uh, you had talked before about breaking ground in May. W what is the update? How soon do you think you can break uh, down? We're projecting the break ground in April now. So we're... <laughs> so. It's, and it's only because, we, you know, our team, it's, it's just not me, it's the people like yourselves and our, our team are working hard every single day at this. And a lot of people don't see what we're doing behind the scenes, and we're not getting a lot of media coverage because we're just out busting our butts trying to get land locked up so we can start building this wall. All right, let's, uh, let's bring down our next guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome former Milwaukee County Sheriff David Clark. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> please sit down. So, Sheriff Clark, you were uh, you were down in that trip in McAllen, Texas, uh, when, when the migrants are just sort of coming out of the bushes. H had you been that close to it before? No, you know, I've received a lot of briefings from border sheriffs uh, for the last several years, and they've been telling me about the challenges that they've had down there. And it's, there's a big difference between hearing about it and actually seeing it. So I went down to see for myself down there with Brian and some others and you know I was in law enforcement for 40 years and it takes a lot to really uh, startle me and I was shocked at what I saw uh, coming across that border at will at ease and it's going on every day now look you know um, forget about getting anything solved in Washington DC Washington DC is broken all right It's dysfunctional, and only President Trump gets it when it comes to securing our southern border. You've all heard the stories. You've seen the, the statistics, the illegals that are coming in. Last year alone, I think they said about 700,000 illegals came into the country, illegal aliens. That's the size of a mid-time, a mid-sized city. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is about 600,000 people, so think about that. You've heard about the drugs coming in last year. Uh, they seized over 300 pounds of fentanyl. That's enough to kill 73 million Americans. Okay, so when you hear this stuff, and the president termed it right, we have a humanitarian crisis at the southern border. You've heard about the, uh, uh, the sex trafficking that goes on, MS-13, other transnational gangs that are coming across. This has to be fixed. The only way it's going to be fixed is when real Americans, folks like yourself, step up to the plate. One thing you can count on from the American citizen is that in a time of crisis, they're going to step up and they're going to be there. You've seen it during fires. You've seen it during earthquakes and floods. The American people will be there. That's what this is about. We build a wall. It's a grassroots outfit. It's a grassroots effort, but it's going to take you to get involved in this as well. Yeah, I'm... Of course, uh... Sheriff, M Milwaukee County is very close to the Canadian border but uh, it's not the same problem, or is it? It's the same problem, not with the Canadian border, but you heard the phrase before I came out here, this is you know, every border, uh, every border, every community is a border town now because of this mass influx. You know, the, the, the entry point is at the southern border, but then it spreads out throughout the United States. We had that same problem. 
Uh, you remember the California law enforcement officer from Newport, uh, Ramil Singh, a new father that was gunned down by an illegal alien who was in the country and deported time and time and time again. But, you know, there are some ranchers and some real people that are being affected by this. You'll hear from some angel families. You know, law enforcement officers had to deal with this. I worked with ICE uh, when I was the sheriff of Milwaukee County, gave them all the information that they needed to make sure that when those people came through the criminal justice system and were arrested, that we flagged them and, and, and ICE made sure that they were put on a list for deportation. Just so people understand, Sheriff, uh, what does it mean when a city becomes a sanctuary city or a state becomes a sanctuary state and refuses to enforce the federal laws or no, no longer cooperate? What does that as a practical matter mean? Yeah, first of all, it's a violation of U.S. sovereignty. You know that. It's also a violation of the uh, uh, effort that the United States is obligated. There's a moral obligation for Congress and for Washington, D.C. They're not going to do it anyway, but they have a moral obligation uh, to fix this thing. So when a, a city or a state or a county designates themselves as a sanctuary city, what it does is it makes you, the American citizen, second-class citizens. Think about that for a minute. You become second-class citizens. You may have seen recently where in the state of Texas they found 50,000 people on the voter roll, illegal aliens on the voter rolls. That's enough to swing an election. That could have swung the election for Georgia governor, which was only a 30,000 uh, 30, vote swing. And also in Florida with the governor and the, and the U.S. Senate office uh, put a race down there was less than 30,000 uh, 30, votes. So you can see what this is going to mean over time as this problem continues to metastasize and continues to grow, it's going to have an impact on you being a United States citizen. Yeah. So, I'm curious, uh, Brian, what have you learned working with, uh, with Sheriff Clark and uh, how's your, are you two, uh, you guys bonding? What are you guys doing right now? What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, we bonding really good. <laughs> no. I mean, he, he, he brings a wealth of knowledge that I don't have, and, you know, like I keep saying I'm just one person. Um, and this team, and we're all a team, you guys are a team, this, this money that was donated is, this is your project, and this, this is the expert, this is one of the experts on our team, and, you know, he's, he's been a law enforcement officer, he brings a ton of information and a ton of knowledge to us, and, you know, his decisions and everything he's been through in life is guiding our project. And it, it's good to have people in the law enforcement field because they've had boots on the ground. They see what's going on on the streets every day. They know the problems. And we're we'll able to adjust, you know, our mission and, and make sure we're staying focused to our mission with guys like Sheriff Clark. And, uh, you know, he's an asset to our team. Uh, it's a, you know, when people say, uh, Sheriff Clark, that, uh, you know, maybe you can just need drones, uh, maybe you just have, like, uh, sensors, or what are the, explain why a wall is a force multiplier for law enforcement. And for those guys who are actually at the line of scrimmage, what a wall does for them. Yeah, and, and, uh, and that's why I went down to the, uh, the southern border in the Texas area, Rio Grande Valley, and also went over to the uh, Big Bend sector, Sanderson County, uh, different terrain, two different areas, different terrain. So you're going to need different types of security and, and whatnot in some areas, a physical wall, it, you know, would be more effective in some areas, um, surveillance from the air, but you got to have boots on the ground. You have to have more Border Patrol agents. Now, when I went to Big Bend, that is a county of 2,700 square miles. Pretty good sized county, right? 2,700 square miles. At the height, in, at the uh, Border Patrol station down there, at the height of their staffing, they had 92 agents covering 2,700 square miles, which isn't enough as it is. They're down to 19 agents covering that. Okay, so it all depends, and that's what I like about what we're doing here. We're going down to different areas, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, because you're going to need multiple interventions to deal with this thing. A wall won't work everywhere, but it's been identified, these areas. The president has talked about it, about 273 uh, miles or so that he wants an actual physical wall that will help and what that will do is create choke points to, to uh, you know the drugs coming in the, 
the gangs coming in, the human trafficking, and it'll funnel it into areas where the Border Patrol then, then, then can stage in that area and better nab these people as they're coming in instead of waiting for them to get into this 2,700 square miles where you're trying to now find, like, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. Yeah, because when you think about it, uh, there was one area when we were down in McGowan where, uh, what was that short distance when we were on the river, would you say, was, was, that, was that 100 feet? Was that 50 feet of, uh, across the river? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I could probably swim 50 feet, right? <laughs> and, and, and there was absolutely no law enforcement, no protection whatsoever uh, around there. Yeah, there was an inflatable raft that was on the U.S. side uh, that was used to shuttle people back and forth and who, who knows what else is coming across. Not only that, it's pretty shallow in that area as well. So, you know, you can see when you actually go down there, and that's why the people, many of the people in Congress, you know, that are talking off the top of their head, they've never been down there. And if they have been down there, they're lying if they come back and say there's no crisis. There is a crisis. I saw it. We saw it. The people living down there on a daily basis have seen it. Well, <laughs> that's, that's the perfect segue, members of Congress. Uh, joining us now, I'd like to call down uh, former Colorado Republican Congressman Tom Tancredo. And sure just sit right there, put it down. And uh, I don't find And also, the editor of uh, Breitbart, Texas, my old colleague from Breitbart. Brandon Darby. Come on down, Brandon. WWE. Yeah. They're playing the gay song for you. So we'll uh, start off with you, uh, Congressman. Uh, you arrive in Congress. Uh, you understand that maybe uh, there's a problem down at the border. You uh, talk to the Republican leadership, uh, the congressional leadership. They right. said, uh, right. great idea, Tom. What can we do to help? Yeah, exactly. Oh, sure. Uh, it didn't work out just that way, of course. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I came into Congress in 1998. I, I had this as my major issue. I, uh, I made an assumption, and that the assumption was that a majority of my colleagues at least would listen to me about it. I mean, it wasn't, it certainly had not achieved the level of discussion at, that it does now, but it, it nonetheless was out there and I wanted to increase the volume on the discussion because I believe, I still believe to this day, it's probably the most significant, the most important public policy decision we could deal with in the Congress of the United States. It is certainly the most important public policy decision that the President can deal with and God bless him, he's doing that. And, and I, I think it's important to sort of uh, make a distinction. Uh, of course, we know that the Democrats are opposed to uh, the president's national emergency and yeah. border security, but the Republican leadership is not always on the side of border security. So could you just sort of talk about an example of uh, when the Republican leadership sort of put the gabosh on what you were trying sure. to do? Often, uh, to tell you the truth, um, I was uh, called in to the woodshed on more than one occasion because I would go and speak on, about this issue. And oftentimes, well, first of all, I would speak on, on C-SPAN, right, at night. And you're the only person on the floor of the house, and you're, and you're talking away and you're gesticulating, and nobody's out there, you know what I mean? But there, hopefully somebody's watching on C-SPAN. It's, it's the only outlet I had. It's the only way I had of communicating, really, being a freshman member dealing with a subject nobody wanted to deal with. And so, but the more I'd, I'd go into my office and, oh my goodness, all of the, you know, by midnight when I got done, I'd go back to get my stuff and I thought, is anybody really listening? Sure enough, all the lights are going on, the, you know, and the old fax machine, da, 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 you know, faxes come in. I thought, well, somebody is. And so I kept doing it. 
Well, the more I did it, the more I'd get requests to go speak about it. So I'd go, I'd go out all over the country and, and speak, and often was to Republican groups. So, um, and then inevitably, in front of, you know, I'd be talking about the issue in front of a Republican group, and somebody would say, well, how's our guy? How's Fred, you know, on this issue? Nice Republican guy. And I'd say, Fred, he's crap. He's, no, he's, he's lousy. He's no good. Uh, and, and never has been. And he won't vote the right way. And, uh, and, and before I could get out of the door and back on a plane coming home, Fred was on the phone with Tom DeLay. Right? Saying, hey, this guy was in my district and he's saying things about Republicans. He can't do. So Tom DeLay would call me and went on. He did that three, four, or five times. And I'll tell you, he told me something on the last time that tells you everything you want to know about the problems with the Congress of the United States. And there are plenty. But he said to me, listen, you little blank. I've, I've, and actually, I'm taller than he is, believe it or not. But, I don't uh, believe her for a minute. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, <laughs> surprising. But, so um, he said, um, how many times have I called you and how many times have I told you you can't go out and talk about this subject and especially you can't talk about it in attacking Republicans and you can't attack the leadership and you can't attack the president and so I've told you this over and I said, yeah, you have, you have, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to do it as long as I have breath. And he said, okay, and this was like, you know, finger in your nose going, you keep this up type of thing. And I'm thinking, good Lord, you know, I want to call home. Where, where are our kids? Do they have them? You know, uh, it was that kind of of that that threatening voice. You know, and he's you keep this up. He said, and and he goes, and you're going to ruin your career in this place. And I said, what? That's it? <laughs> that's that's what you think is scaring me. You think that this is, but it would. My point is, he would use that with everybody, you know, with every Fred. member. And, and of course, it would petrify them because that's exactly what they're doing. It is their career in this place. And I said, listen, Tom, I don't know how to break this to you, but, but in fact, I don't want a career in this place, number one. And number two, I don't even like this place. <laughs> yeah. And uh, things went downhill from there. <laughs> and so, you know, no committee assignments of, of consequence. Y you know, you're blacklisted from everything. And so after 10 years, I decided, well, I've probably burned every bridge there is to burn here, and, and I did quit. But I ran for president first, you know. <laughs> and now he's with us. <laughs> now I'm with you. That's right. And, and mo I, I am prouder to be here than I ever was in Congress. Yeah. You know, Probably, uh, probably one of the uh, least talkative guys I've ever met is uh, Brandon Darby, but hopefully we'll be able to get some words out of him. He was, uh, before he became a reporter, before he uh, really built Breitbart, Texas into the monster site that it is now, he was involved in law enforcement, and for what, the last 10 years, Brandon, you've been sort of living the border and uh, what goes on down there. What is it? What is it that you didn't know 10 years ago that you wish you knew 10 years ago? Well, hey, uh, guys, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for coming. Uh, you know, I can't really answer that question. I, I can tell you this. Um, it seems like even when we're in power and we have the White House and we have Congress, we still didn't get our borders secured, you know? And I've spent close to the last decade, now we're, we're pushing nine something years, touring the Southwest border every month. And some of you may know this, some of you may not. There are nine sectors on the US-Mexico border, the Southwest border, nine sectors, okay? All of those nine sectors are dealing with something very different. They're dealing, some of them have two or three different types of terrain. All of them are dealing with their own Mexican cartels. There's not the Mexican cartel or, or there's hundreds of Mexican cartels, right? And there's, there's a select few that, who operate on our border. So I really thought going into this, you know, I came, I came at it from a humanitarian angle. I was working with sex trafficking victims, human trafficking victims. I'd worked undercover 
uh, with uh, certain law enforcement, a certain law enforcement agency, and it led me to the border. So I approached it from a humanitarian angle, and I really thought, man, if Americans just realized what was happening here, if they realized that more than half of Mexico was actually under the control of cartels. And when I say under the control, all of it's under the influence, but li listen to me. When I say under control, I'm talking about 32 states in Mexico, okay? When the federal government in Mexico wants to go get someone or do a simple police action, they have to send in their Marines. They have to send in armored convoys. How many of you realize that? How many of you realize that the country south of our border is a failed narco state? It's a failed narco state. And here's the deal. This is going to sound like extreme rhetoric, but listen to me. It's a failed narco state under the control of paramilitary transnational criminal organizations that we call Mexican cartels colloquially. That's, that's the simple term, the lamest term for them. Okay? They control our border. We have several counties for working with and for the Mexican Gulf cartel. That's bad. And now those same offices and those same communities are saying no to the wall, no to the border, no to more border security. When they have historically been on the payroll of Mexican cartels, and that's in the United States of America. That's what we're dealing with. We're, so I always thought if we just told people what was happening, if I just screamed loud enough, that it would change everything. And what I found is not that at all. What I found is a situation where there is an organized entity, right, composed of Democrats, their allies in media, and Republicans, not all Republicans, obviously, but a lot of Republicans, and they sow disinformation. When the President of the United States said that up to one-third of migrant women coming from Central America were sexually assaulted, he said that in his, in his State of the Union address. The Washington Post fact-checked him and said it was false because it's only 31.4 percent. No, that's the kind of disinformation and twisting and spin that we're dealing with as a country. So. If, if I had to say what would I have done differently over the last decade of my life, touring that border on the Mexico side, on the U.S. side, going into Mexico every month of my life, going in just the craziest situations to get sources, what I would have done differently is I probably would have started off more like Brian's doing. I would have stopped thinking that if I just told the truth, the media would do the right thing and our government would do the right thing. And I would have went directly to you and I would have said, let's do this on our own and embarrass our government into doing it right. Now, now here's the thing. Now listen, guys, this is really important because I have limited time with you. Listen to me, please. When we're talking about building the wall or the barrier or the fence or the, the happy unicorn barrier, whatever you want to call it, okay, that's not the end goal, okay? Like if you're going to get chemotherapy, that's not the end goal. You're getting chemotherapy because of an underlying problem, okay? Building this wall, building this wall is a, is a treatment for an underlying problem. And th that problem are Mexican cartels. That's the problem. They're poisoning our communities. We have record numbers of people dying from drug addiction in this country while they're raking profits. Some of the cartels, like the Reynosa faction of the Gulf Cartel, they're routinely making more money from asylum claims now, from illegal immigration, than they are from drugs. They've become an illegal immigration cartel on our border. That is what the problem is. And so what I would have done differently in closing is I would have went directly to you and I would have said, hey, let's try to build barriers on private land. Hey, let's raise funds and let's use human sources and technology and let's go after these Mexican cartels, not only in our communities, but in Mexico, because there's a legal way to do it that we, the people, can do it. That's what I would have done differently. Oh,
Thank you. So, Jennifer, uh, you, you uh, have some people who might, might want to ask some questions. Yes. Who would like to ask some questions? Are you here? What's your name, ma'am, and where are you from? Susan from Fort Mitchell. I would like to know what an average person thinks in the southern part of the country about what is their life like? Do they want to sell their house and move north? What, how do they see the Along our southern border, are, well, a lot of them are, are Democrats. A lot of them are, 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 a lot of them are heavily populated by, by immigrant communities. Um, a lot of them are heavily populated by, uh, by people in the country illegally, illegal aliens. And it's not as simple. The, the problem that we have as a nation is we are allowing the people who live along the border to determine like whether or not we can keep our community safe here because the problems with Mexico, see most of the communities along the border, if you look at, in Mexico, it's heinous. It's the most dangerous places on the world, in the world right now, in Mexico on the border. But in the US, most of the Mexican cartels, they have rules and they make people not commit crimes in those border communities. Because if they commit crimes there, it's gonna increase the law enforcement presence, right? which is gonna make it harder for them to get drugs and people through. So the crimes from Mexican cartels are here. The crimes from Mexican cartels are like what happened in 2013 or 12 when the Sinaloa cartel kidnapped a couple, had MS-13 members working for them, kidnapped a couple of kids in St. Paul, Minnesota to find out what happened to stolen drugs and then cut one of their fingers off, left it hanging by this, that, that's what we're dealing with. So the problem is, is that a lot of the communities on the border, ones who have, you know, it's kind of like you have a white t-shirt and you wear your white shirt and you love your white shirt. And then one day you go into Dillard's or the Gap and you stand next to a new white shirt and you're like, oh my gosh, my shirt is dingy. It's not, it's not as white, I had no perspective. So a lot of them have always lived with this, but we can't allow those communities to, to tell the rest of America that they can't secure themselves. Yeah, Brian? Yes. Yeah. There was one thing to add to that, your question, and I think from some of the people I've met with on the border, they feel that the United States government has neglected them, and they feel neglected by the government. And frankly, they don't trust the government because they've been neglected. Uh, they, they, love their, they love where they're at, they're ranchers, they've grown up in these towns, they've seen their property values decrease. Uh, communities be wiped out, uh, people moving and just decimated over the decades, last few decades, and they feel neglected, and that's, that's, that's all it is. And those are good people who feel okay. neglected. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please, Congress. Just add something to that. And, you know, um, you mentioned the fact that um, there are so many people that have been incarcerated, <clears throat> so many people on our side, police chiefs and, and various others who are now in jail for what they have done. But understand this. Corruption does not stop at the border, okay? Especially when you're talking about hundreds of million, billions of dollars flowing across that border from illegal sources, both drugs and people. So what has happened is many of these communities have been corrupted. They are, in fact, dirty. People on our side of the border, they're dirty. And, and the worst thing that has happened in Congress in a long time was that, quote, budget agreement, that bill that we passed just a little bit ago. Um, let me tell you, part of that bill included something that is absolutely devastating to us. And that is, it said that in Texas, local communities can veto the wall. All right, well, what do you think these communities that I've just described are going to do and are doing and are saying? We don't want a wall. Of course not. They don't want a wall. Their livelihood is based upon their ability to continue this illegal flow of both drugs and people. And that was in that bill, and it is, it's a travesty. Right, let, let me add to that. See, this is where we get into tricky situations, because if we go into the cities near the border, and they're heavily Democrat, and they're against the wall, and they're against, they think it's racist, and they think, okay, 
But now, what about the private property owner on the border? What about the person who owns a ranch or a piece of land on the border who does want a barrier? They do want security. They do want their property protected, you know? And that's really what we're here for, is we're here for those people. Like the, the tyranny of the majority in liberal cities along the border don't get, they shouldn't be able to stop private property owners along the border from being able to secure their property. Yeah, we want to go. go ahead, Jennifer, please. One quick, one quick thing. If you guys have questions, please come over here and ask your questions. And this is Gary from Columbus. So what's your question, Gary? Well, I have a comment and a question quickly. Um, first of all, I watched the fund level go up and up and up and up and up quickly. Then I saw the plateau. And I want to just encourage anybody here or anybody watching to whom much is given, much is also required. We need to give again if we can. We need to get this fund going back up again. My question is this. If we're someone who, obviously the passion about this is obvious. If we're someone who has time beyond just giving money, if we can give our time and our effort, how do we get involved if we can go down there and give some time? Do you want us to go down? And how, does, how do you make that available to us so we can do that? Brian? Yeah, we're uh, on our website, we're setting up a volunteer platform where um, members of the community, anyone in the United States who wants to volunteer, uh, whether it be like trucking companies or man labor or whatever, whatever your specialty may be. Um, once we start building, we're going to be getting these volunteers. So just go to our website at webuildthewall.us. And I think it's, it might be under about, or it's somewhere on the website, there's a volunteer section. Jennifer can um, tell you where to go exactly. If you, if you don't have a specialty, I think that we will, if it goes in, we will read it. So if you just put what you are good at or what you want to do, just let us know and we'll reach out to you. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Should we try to get one more? Yeah, this is Mark from Cincinnati. And Mark has a question. Let's get a couple of oh, answers real quick. And uh, I was wondering, our mayor, John Cranley, who is a Democrat, made this a sanctuary city, and I wonder if you guys knew that before you came here. I can't hear. I can't understand. Can they turn up the volume on that mic? Can you turn up the volume on the mic, please? Okay, my name is Mark from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I was wondering if you knew that John Cranley, our Democratic mayor, has made this a sanctuary city before you guys came here. <laughs> We didn't know that. <laughs> Go ahead, Sheriff, please. Sheriff? That, that kind of dovetails off the last question about what people can do. And, and you don't have to run down to the border. Right now, there are some groups down there, volunteer groups, Texas Minutemen, or some people that I talked to when I was in Sanderson County. And uh, take care of your own town first. If you're a sanctuary city, a sanctuary county, or a sanctuary state, fight these bastards, damn it. Let me, let me, uh, go ahead, Chief. Guys, listen here. This is where you ask what you can do, and this is where it becomes extremely important that you have information, okay? I'm here tonight. Um, I'm not here as a representative of Breitbart. I'm just here as Brandon, the border guy, the border expert, the guy who spent so much time there. But check out our work. Read our work, arm yourselves, because the biggest thing that people are gonna come at you with when you try to talk to them about sanctuary cities or you try to talk to them about the border and how it impacts your community is they're gonna try to make you look like a monster and that you're racist or that this is somehow about stopping brown people from coming here. And that's not the deal. But if you read our work, you'll see that. You'll see the way that an unsecured border you'll see the humanitarian consequences of it, and you'll be a lot better off when it comes to fighting liberals on this issue. Just pay attention to our work, guys. Yeah. Neil, right, do we have time for one more question? All right, everybody, how about a big round of applause for uh, Tom Tancredo, <clears throat> Brendan Darby, and Sheriff Clark. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay, I'd like to call down uh, 
Chris Kobach, who's the former Secretary of State of uh, Kansas, who's also working with We Build the Wall, and my old boss at uh, Breitbart, Stephen K. Bannon. Gentlemen. <laughs> Two gentlemen, uh, <laughs> you guys might be at a loss for words, but we'll try to get something out of you. Uh, Chris, why don't you talk about how you first heard about the project and how you first got in touch with working with Brian? Well, uh, a lot, as you'll notice, a lot of these people are part of the Make America Great Again movement, and so uh, there are a lot of people who knew each other in this, in this organization. And uh, I can't remember whether Brian called me or I called Brian, but we were told to get in touch with each yeah. other. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, uh, Steve was involved, and it became very clear that we needed uh, to do something and do something now. And it became very clear from Brian's effort in December that the American people uh, were saying, please, please, th this is exactly what we want to invest in, what we want to, you know, how we want to be involved. I mean, you can call your congressman, you can, you can call him every single day, and he might eventually vote the right way. But that isn't necessarily going to cause anything to happen to secure our country, whereas this is something people can do, you know, palpably and actually have an effect, and then the money goes to a, a barrier that is stopping people from coming in. And uh, Steve, you just came back from Japan, and uh, you're traveling all around the world, and now, why are you in Cincinnati with Brian and these guys tonight? Well, I'm in Cincinnati very simply, because the border crisis is in Ohio. The border crisis is in Michigan, where we're going to be on Thursday. You know, it's just not McAllen, Texas, uh, in, in the cities of the Rio Grande, or Nogales, or Douglas, Arizona, or Tucson. This border crisis is a national crisis. It's a crisis of rule of law. It's a crisis of our sovereignty. But it's also a crisis of our education system, the health care system, crime, the opioid crisis, drugs. It's also a humanitarian crisis of what's happening in Central America, in the, dr in the human traffickers, as Brandon, or now referred to him as Brandon the Border Guy. <laughs> I've never seen a guy brand himself in the middle of a TV show. <laughs> Brandon the Border No. But what... What Brandon said, I think, is, is, is incredibly important. I think that's one of the reasons that Breitbart Texas and the work that Brandon did is so powerful. And what Brian and I talked about the very first time I got on the phone with Brian. Brian's a veteran. You know, Brian gave all for his country over in the Middle East. You know, this year, we're going to spend $67.5 billion in Afghanistan. We have, what, 14,000 troops, 15,000 troops. We have another 30,000 contractors, I think. It's totally like 35 or 40,000 uh, fighters over there. We're going to spend $67.5 billion. What Brandon Darby said is the relevant point. We essentially have, and this is not all of Mexico, but a lot of Mexico is a failed narco state. It is totally lawless, complete anarchy, and that is what's driven up into the United States of America. There are many parts along the border we don't even have operational control. That's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable to people in Maine, in Washington, Ohio, and Michigan. And so, in this, in this effort, and what President Trump's trying to do, and what Brian's doing here at Build the Wall, which is really augmenting what President Trump's trying to do, is not, is not demonizing uh, these migrants, not demonizing people coming up. This is a, a tragedy of biblical proportions. But one way to fix it is not to have an open border. What we need is rule of law. As Tom Tancredo has been saying for 10 and 15 years, you need rule of law and we need to have our sovereignty. And if we can spend $67 billion in Afghanistan, and if we can put 15,000 troops and another 30,000 contractors, we can have President Trump's back to do it. And in the case we can't do it, an American hero who fought over in the Middle East for our defense is going to help us do it. Brian Kofach, thank you very much. Thank you.
Greg, please, Chris. Let me add to that, too. In addition to the, the, all of these compelling reasons why we need to act, let me just put this in perspective, the scope of the problem. It is so huge. The border is approximately 1,933 miles long. The amount of border that we currently have secured right now with a barrier that will stop pedestrians, not a Normandy barrier, which is just a horizontal steel post that will stop a car, but you can hop right over it, that will actually stop pedestrians is less than 100 miles out of an over 1,900-mile over border. Congress just gave President Trump enough to build 55 miles. It, with the money that he wants to reprogram through the National Emergency Declaration, that will maybe give him another 250 miles. So if he gets all the money he wants, all the miles he can build, th that's only 300 miles that we're talking about right now. And that still leaves 1,500 miles wide open. That's why we have to act. We, the people, have got to step up in addition to what the federal government is doing and build what we can. If it's five miles, that's great. If it's 50 miles, that's better. If it's 500 miles, that's amazing. The states need to be stand stepping up. States like Arizona and Texas on the border should be saying, hey, we'll do it too. We'll, you, we'll build on state land. There's a ton of state land along the border. We are never going to seal off this border if we don't start now and start building quickly and start doing it right away. Jennifer, next up. Here you go, sir. Yes, and my name is Walt Davis. I'm a farmer from Lebanon, Ohio. Uh, first, I'd like to thank OAN for carrying this. We so much appreciate your being here. Uh, I, uh, my wife and I have made three relatively small contributions so far. We're excited about doing more, especially once construction gets underway. My question is this. Uh, about a month ago, I saw a note come through that said we might have an opportunity to sponsor the various steel uh, pillars that will be used in, in the fence. I think uh, the sponsorship was $1,000 a piece. And I'd personally be interested in about 14 of those for my family. <laughs> I get his name. <laughs> Yeah, I can talk to you. I, I can. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I think, uh, I think I posted that. It was something we were kind of floating out and trying to get ideas, because ultimately this is your guys' project. We wanted to get the community involved, and um, it's a way for everyone to, to have their name on a section of that wall. Uh, we, haven't, we don't have it finalized yet, but it's definitely something we're working on. We want to get the community involved, because ultimately this is the people's wall, and you know, it's all more than merry. If you're donating toward this, you need, we need to allow you guys to have something for life, showing that you guys came and built this wall, and that's what it's about. Well, and it's like, you know, so many people will donate to a project, and then they'll be able, they'll put their name on it, whether it's a, a brick on a, on a sidewalk or whatever, and then they can say to their ground children, hey, you know, we, we, we stood up and when America needed help, and we did it, so we're talking about maybe having a monument with the names of everybody who contributed, or, or, or pillars of, of the steel bollard fence. But I think that's important because it shows that we, the people, individually are doing this. This isn't just the big, amorphous federal government acting. This is us stepping forward and saying, yes, I will act individually, and yes, I want to put my name on that because I believe it's the right thing to do. Senator? We have Ian from Cincinnati. Uh, I had a question about, you know, earlier you were talking about people intentionally getting caught or to seek asylum. Um, you know, once the government's done with their game of chicken, uh, is there anything that you think that the federal government could do to restore the circular flow and to help people who actually want to be participating members of society? I couldn't hear. So well, he's like, asking, after the government is done with their game of chicken with having the illegals look for Border Patrol, is there anything we can do to um, unify immigrants coming into this country legally, and what can we do to fix our broken immigration system? Well, one of the biggest problems is that, that the federal government needs to fix right away is the f uh, flawed asylum claims that people are making. Right now, one of the strangest things that's happening is you will see groups of 50, groups of 100, people walking across the border in broad daylight 
and presenting themselves to a Border Patrol vehicle saying, please arrest me, here are the magic words I have to say. But, to but let, let, let's talk about when we took the team down to McAllen, Texas, and we brought the Israeli company over that's going to help us with the engineering of the wall a month ago. Tell exactly what happened in just a random Tuesday afternoon at 1 o'clock. Yeah, so we, we show up and uh, a group of about, I don't know, 30, 30 or so, oh no, we see a group of about 15 uh, people walking up to a Border Patrol vehicle to present themselves and claim asylum. And they're not, you know, asylum is for people who are facing the credible fear of persecution because of their membership in a particular social group. That is the legal definition of it. These are just people who are coming to America to find a job. And then we go a little further toward the border, and another group of about 30 or 35 people is walking uh, toward the border. Also, to, in broad daylight, nobody's sneaking across in the middle of the night, and they're walking straight to meet a Border Patrol vehicle and, and claim asylum. And that's part of the problem, is that we, because of uh, some court decisions and some other twists, I won't get into the legal nitty-gritty, uh, people are u abusing our asylum system. The solution to that is we have to pass a, promulgate a regulation. The Trump administration is working on that. And ideally, Congress could completely solve the problem by passing a law. But don't expect any help from Democrats, because I think so many of them like this abuse of our asylum system. So I'd like to say hello to Jim Hoff and Gateway Pundit. We have a few questions that came in from them. And the first one is, Steve, how long can the US withstand open borders along with its generous welfare state? I don't think the I don't think the United States can withstand it now. I think open borders is one of the things that's that's uh, driving the economic problems in this country. Remember, President Trump just put forward a budget, and this is President Trump put forward a budget that has a one trillion dollar deficit every year for the next four years. Right? We don't even balance the budget, and I think into the fifteenth year, the fifteenth year, and this is President Trump who's trying to do everything possible to balance the budget. The, the, the uh, Democrats are now talking about situations where there's $22 trillion here, $30 trillion there. So I think that, it, I don't know if the country can go on much longer unless it's gonna be a very different country. You can't have this welfare system. You can't have the social services we have. And that's what this border wall is about. It's about protecting African-American and Hispanic working class because the game is they want to flood the zone and this is a lot of the Chamber of Commerce and the Republican donors with the Democrats want to flood the zone with tons of low-skilled illegal alien labor to compete against Hispanic and black working class. That's why wages have been so down for so long. That's why wages haven't increased. That's what President Trump's trying to stop. In addition, it's destruction of the, of the health care facilities and the education system. If you go into southern Texas or Arizona, you'll see it. The working class in this country, working men and women, of every race and gender cannot take the burden of the economic problems in Central America. And these economic problems are real. It, 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 is, it, is not, it is not the fault of the migrants. What Chris just said is very important. We have a political asylum system, right? If you live in a fear of because of political oppression, okay? We don't have an economic asylum situation. That's the same thing that's happening in Europe. Right? That has to deal with legal immigration. What we have to do is build this wall to stop this onslaught and then to really focus on the laws all the, all the way they're trying to game the system. And this is to help the people in Central America so they're not trafficked right, for profit. It's to help the working class, not just in the border states, but in Ohio. The reason that we're here, it's Ohio and Michigan's problem, just like it's the Rio Grande Valley's problem. So. That, that question was, how long can our welfare state stand it? This is sort of an obvious problem, uh, and no one better said it than the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, Milton Friedman. He said it more than 20 years ago. He said, it's just obvious. You can't have open immigration and a welfare state. It's just obvious. You can't have open immigration and a welfare state. And we can't. And the, the numbers are staggering right now. It's estimated that the average, that in a typical year, uh, illegal aliens consume net over $100 billion a year in uh, public benefits. That's net. That's after you take into account any sales taxes they pay, any other taxes they pay. There's still, we're still $100 billion in the hole if you look at federal government expenditures and state and local expenditures. So we taxpayers, even if we haven't lost a job individually because of illegal immigration or lost a loved one, we are losing our taxpayer dollars, every single one of us and everybody watching at home, because of illegal immigration. One last thing. 
if you want to build the wall and help President Trump build the wall, because we're just here to augment, right? The central part has got to be President Trump, the administration, and this fight he has every day. Don't lift the debt ceiling. Make them give us a wall to give Wall Street relief on the debt ceiling, and that's coming up in about six weeks. In about six weeks, this is going to be a national debate. If you want to have your voice heard, just say, we're not going to increase the debt ceiling one penny, right? Not one penny. <laughs> You build the wall. So, so we have Tim from Columbus. Hold on, Jennifer. Before we uh, before we sign off with One American News, Brian, why don't uh, why don't you sort of talk about uh, your plan moving forward and uh, some final thoughts before we lock out? Yeah. Well, the plan moving forward right now, you know, up to this point, we've been on the border. Uh, we've been selecting land, going through the surveying process, uh, a lot of legal stuff, getting this land acquired. Um, we're hoping to break ground in April, by the, at least by the end of April, and that will be our first you know, section of wall. And we can do this wall mile by mile for at least half of what the United States government is paying. And that's the incredible thing about this is we can do more miles cheaper and no one can stop us. The only thing they can stop us is when we run out of money. But we can keep building and building and building, but we need the support of the American people. And Where we're at right now with this project, it's about to explode. And it, as soon as we break ground, I know you guys are watching the GoFundMe and tracking it. The, at, those numbers are not correct. Don't go off that. Don't lose hope in all that. Um, we are about to ex explode this when we get those shovels in the, in the dirt and start breaking ground again. That's just going to go gangbusters. A uh, lot of donors, are, are big donors, are waiting for us to see what we're going to do and see that we can actually get it done. And that's going to be the tipping point for this project. When people see that we're getting it done, it's going to explode, and uh, it's going to explode because of all you guys. And all you guys are the army in this project, so just, just keep st sticking with it. Um, keep having our back, get the word out, and keep pushing forward with us. That's going, to, uh, that's going to wrap it up for One American News tonight. The conversation continues on gatewaypundit.com. Uh, Thank you very much, and good night. Thanks, One America. One America. Let them know it's not over. I saw some people go for the doors. I just, I just had to say goodbye to my. Oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. No, I think some of the people thought it was over. Yeah. Hey. Here, go ahead. Hang on, we're gonna get to the good stuff now. <laughs> we're gonna get everybody down here. Then we're going to do more Q&A with the audience. Sit. We're going to have total feedback. We're going to do the town hall part. Please sit down. We get more chairs. Want we'll to check your mics? Everybody check. Testing, okay, here testing, we go, Steve. Testing, testing, testing. It's only 8 o'clock. I think so. A lot of time, guys. Okay. We, uh, let's go. Um, before we go to any more questions, I want to introduce Angel Mom and Angel Dad. I want you to t t stand up, tell your stories, take a few minutes, because this is, this is one of the reasons we're here. This is one of the biggest problems we got, and nobody talks about it. Until President Trump came along, right, and brought this to the forefront, nobody in the country right. wanted to discuss this. <clears throat> My name is Mary Ann Mendoza, and, angry. and almost five years ago, my life was forever changed. My son was a Mesa, Arizona police officer, and we had spent Mother's Day together. He went in for his afternoon shift at 1 o'clock in the morning, a repeat illegal alien criminal who had committed crimes before in our country and was allowed to remain here, had driven over 35 miles the wrong way was three times the legal limit drunk, high on meth, and slammed on into, head on into my son on the freeway in Phoenix. My son ultimately died a few hours later in surgery. At the time, I thought I was like the only person in the world who had been affected like this when I realized he was an illegal alien. And when I started doing investigated and research, I was stunned at how many Americans had been killed five years ago 
by illegal alien criminals. And I entered this fight because I realized, number one, I had to be a voice for my son, but I had to be a voice for each and every one of you because it isn't a matter of if this is gonna happen to you, it's a matter of when, if this continues to go down the path that it's going. You will know somebody, if not your family personally, who's going to be affected by illegal alien crime. Over 4,000 a year are killed by illegal aliens. Um, What's that number? Over 4,000 a year, and that's 4, a very conservative number, are killed by illegal aliens. That's not counting the people who are affected by drugs and deaths coming over our border, which is in the tens of thousands alone every year. It's not counting the people who survive illegal alien crime, which is the hundreds of thousands every year, rape, assault, identity theft. All of these things on a daily basis are affecting people that you know, or maybe some of you in the audience. So it became, um, it was an honor to be asked to join the advisory board with We Build the Wall and, and, and be in their presence and fight alongside them and let my son still have a voice and protect the people of America and in our community at home. So thank you for being here and please spread the word for us. <laughs> I'm Steve Ronnebeck. This is Grant. Grant was 21 years old. He was working the overnight shift at a quick trip in Mesa, Arizona. An illegal alien came in and wanted to buy a pack of cigarettes, dumped a jar of change out on the counter, and Grant went to start counting the change. Evidently, Grant wasn't counting fast enough. This man said, what, you're not going to give me my cigarettes? Grant tried to explain to him, hey, I need to count your change. This man pulled a gun. Grant did everything he was supposed to do. He handed over the cigarettes. As soon as he did, this man shot Grant point blank in the face. He then went around the counter, stepped over Grant's dead body, grabbed a couple more packs of cigarettes, stepped back over Grant, stopped, turned, and watched Grant for a few seconds to make sure he was dead all the time reaching into his right front pocket where the gun was because he was going to finish him if he wasn't. These are the animals that we have coming across our border. Okay, 63,000 Americans since 9-11 have been killed by illegal aliens. We only lost a little over 58,000 in the Vietnam War. These are statistics that, that are they're, they're getting bigger as the days go by. Um, I, I'll give you another one. 32,000 Mexican citizens have been killed because of the cartel wars, I do believe, Brandon, something like that last year. Yeah, about 32,000. There were only a little over 12,000 Iraqi citizens killed last year because of the war. So that would mean we'd be safer having Iraq as a border country than we would Mexico. That's scary. The heroin, the fentanyl that's coming across our border is killing our children and our loved ones. We've got to do something to build this wall. And you guys can help build this wall. Brian is succeeding where our politicians are failing. Uh, Jen, I think we have a special guest. You want to introduce her and let yeah, her tell her story? I do. Virginia, she lost her daughter, Tiffany. Um, she was 26 years old, and I'm going to let you tell your story, but thank you for being here, and I'm so sorry to hear about your daughter. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's Virginia Krieger. I live here in Ohio. My daughter, Tiffany, my only daughter, was my best friend. She was my right hand, she was my world. She was a semi-finalist on American Idol, graduated high school a year early, and started college. She came back to Ohio for two weeks to visit relatives. We were living out of state at that time, and it, she met the wrong person. 
He wasn't a good guy at all. In fact, he was a drug dealer. She didn't know that at first. She had a surgery and it started off with pain pills. But when those weren't available anymore, right on the corner waiting for her were the Mexican drugs and the fentanyl that killed her. She left behind a three and a five year old, my grandchildren that I still to this day am fighting the courts to get custody. I don't understand how we could have a 980% increase in illegal narcotic deaths in only eight years. That we could lose 70,000 people a year. That's just to the illegal drugs. Enough to fill a football stadium. And yet Senator Sherrod Brown, in the face of this huge epidemic, can go on Twitter and say that he doesn't support border security in the face of the biggest epidemic in Ohio's history. These aren't throwaway people. These are people's children, their brothers, their sisters, their mothers, and they, they deserve to live. What I want to know, um, and maybe you can answer this for me, Steve, is uh, we have Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, all of them saying there's no border emergency, yet they know about all these deaths. When they, when they labeled this, they called it an opioid epidemic and they pointed at the doctors, but they didn't want to say heroin or fentanyl because 98% of that comes over the southern border. Um, there's been word that they're receiving campaign donations from, camp, from sources with these cartels. Um, do you know if that's true? And if it is true, is that a conflict of interest if they're voting against border wall security? Look, I, I don't think that's true. You hear rumors all the time. Listen, thank you very much. And this is exactly why we wanted you to speak tonight, is that th this is why... <clears throat> This, this problem is not in Arizona. It's not simply in the Rio Grande Valley. One of the things I think Brian is doing in this, in, in creating this movement to augment the president and the people in the government of both political parties as we fight this out about building the wall is exactly that. It's, it's, it's to augment this, but it's a national crisis. And this is not going to go away. You know, 70,000 deaths, 68,000 deaths by, by, by being killed and then 70,000 deaths. It, it's, this, is going, this is an epidemic and it's going to go on and on and on. Thank you so much for standing up. It was very, very brave. I mean, th this is the reality. We've allowed this to happen to this country. Brian, how much of this, I mean, and this is why I'm so proud of President Trump. The voices, and Brandon, you know this, the voices of the angel moms and dads were, it was never discussed. These stories were never talked about. It was an issue that no, because the numbers are so huge, the brutality is so, so tremendous. Nobody ever wanted to discuss, no politician wanted to discuss it until Trump came along. How much of that was an inspiration for you, Brian? I mean, it's, it's, it's all an inspiration for me. Pretty much that's, that's why we're doing this. I have two kids, are five and three, and I couldn't imagine going through what these families have gone through. And um, hearing their stories firsthand, uh, is what, you know, that, that's what drives me. It should be driving every one of you. And it should be driving all of America because we, we all have children, grandchildren, and we, you know, we have young ones. And we, how can we not do this? How can we just ignore these families? How can we not want border security? How can you not want to protect your family, your neighbor's family, your children, your family's children, whatever? How can you not want to protect them? How can you ignore them? It just, it blows my mind that people ignore it. It blows my mind. And, and this is not what our country is about. We should be coming together around these families to do what's right to fix the problem. And the problem is that border wall, the problem is the cartels, and that's what we're doing here. We're coming together around these families to get the job done because the government's failing.
Steve. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm sorry for your loss. You know, Kate Steinle and Molly Tippetts, they grabbed the headlines. And, and there's no doubt about it. This is tragic. But when you see the people depicted here, when you listen to the Angel families, here's what I warn people. This is coming to a city near you because it's just a matter of time and, and probably has affected a lot of people already in this crowd where you know somebody, where you know somebody who knows somebody whose child died from a fentanyl overdose or some sort of drug overdose. And, and I tell you, as I move around through this and I see this stuff, I'm affected by this. Like I said, the, the Molly Tibbetts and, and the Kate Steinle get the headlines, and, and rightfully so, okay? Those were national cases. These are national cases too. This stuff rips my heart out. It really does to see people's loved ones taken away from them and the primes of their lives. And our country's in a position to do something about it and they stand by and do nothing. It really makes me sick. I um, just wanna say, I, I, I served with Sherrod Brown I know him, and I will tell you right now, and I hope I am speaking directly to him when I say this. You, Mr. Brown, are complicit in the death of this lady's daughter. Not just you, not just you, but every single, every single politician that refuses to deal with this issue because they know that their power base relies upon massive illegal immigration. And so that's what's more important to them than, than the children of these people here or these people here. They are complicit in their deaths. And I'll tell you, every single person that's, that votes for a sanctuary city, every one of them, it's the same way. The people that are then killed in their district, in their city, in their location, they are, they are almost equally responsible for the death as the person that pulled the trigger. Before I go back to where just take questions a second, Brandon, briefly, the cartels, they are now make an amazing amount of money on, on shoving these drugs up here into the heartland of this country. Now also the human trafficking. Very briefly, talk, are, are these cartels terrorist organizations? Are they paramilitary organizations? What do we have to do and what do the politicians have to do to shut down the cartels? All right. Um, Three minutes. Three minutes, yeah which means 15, two and a half. But, um, to the mother who just spoke, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. To you guys, I'm sorry. I, I hate that. Um, I go into Mexico a lot and I meet families there, not illegal alien, people who live in Mexico, they're Mexicans and they want to better their own communities. And they have the same problem there, right? They're affected by this too. It isn't just us, it isn't just them. It's a bunch of people are affected by what we're doing with this border, by having an unsecured border between a wealthy nation and a failed narco state, okay? A lot of people are affected and I'm sorry, but I'm here to tell you, you are not powerless to fight back. You are not powerless. I'm going to tell you a brief story, and there's a reason I'm telling it to you. When Bannon was in charge of Breitbart, we started a project called the Cartel Chronicles. And we went into Mexico, and we found journalists who would otherwise get murdered if the cartels knew they were writing about them. But they had all this information on the cartels. So we started letting those Mexican journalists tell their stories, expose the cartel guys in their communities, and we started publishing in English and Spanish. And what we learned was that our government does not prioritize cartel bosses, the people responsible for pumping this stuff into our country and the people into our country. They don't prioritize them unless they're made to because they're in this balancing act of balancing their diplomacy and their trade policy, right, with diplomats who are connected to cartels. So they, they play softball with cartels in Mexico. We have men like your son. We have men and women in law enforcement 
fighting this drug war very sincerely, losing their lives, fighting the immigration war very sincerely, losing their lives. And on the top levels of our government in Mexico and our State Department, they tell the FBI, they tell the DEA, the State Department tells HSI, hey, you need to back off and balance your law enforcement priorities with our diplomatic concerns. So when we started Cartel Chronicles, we would take one cartel boss at a time, write about him, focus attention on him. It would embarrass the U.S. government, it would embarrass the State Department, and it would embarrass the Mexican government, and they would take that guy out. And out of the last 10 guys we've written about, seven of them are dead and three of them are in custody. Well, let me tell you something. Hey, hey, listen. You are not powerless. A lot of people are going to say to you, building the wall isn't going to stop drugs. No, it's going to stop some of them, and it is going to impact the cartels. Building a wall, building the barrier, is one part of a needed, multi-tiered solution to a complex problem. But if you stick with us, and we stick together as a movement, and we stick together as a people, we are going to be able to amp this thing up and do a lot more than building a wall. We're going to build that wall, which is a big accomplishment, and we're going to do a lot more. We're going to devise a plan to go after and dismantle and destroy Mexican cartels and their networks in our country. Here, here. We are going to bring justice to this mother. We are going to bring justice to these angel parents, these families. We are not going to let our country become a damn drug den because of Mexican cartels and U.S. politicians in the State Department who are afraid to do something about it. You stick with us and we can do this together. I promise you there is a way to do it. We are not powerless. Uh, Jen, can, can we have a next question? Yes, yeah, so this is Tim from Columbus. Good evening. I'd like to thank you all for coming to Ohio, and I'd like to th thank the law enforcement for being here to ensure that we have a safe evening. I'd also like to say thanks to Andrew Ginther, our mayor in Columbus, Ohio. We're also a sanctuary city. My question is, if I knowingly help somebody that was a criminal, that would be called aiding and abetting. Is that correct, Sheriff? And I could be put in jail for doing so. So my question is, how are all these politicians doing this with no consequences and helping illegals and drug cartel in this country? And not only that, I've been told by several law enforcement agencies that they have had, have been told unless you have a certain amount of illegal immigrants, don't bother calling ICE. How is it that these people that are telling our law enforcement officers to do this, not paying any consequences for breaking the law? So one of the amazing things about our immigration laws is there's actually, you hear this, this cop out all the time, oh, our laws are broken, our laws are broken. Everybody agrees our laws are broken. That's what the politicians say. No, the, the immigration code, is if you look at the, the statutes and the regulations, it's about that thick on, on on onion paper. I'm talking thousands of pages. And there's a lot of good stuff in there that is being broken every single day. Did you know that Congress made it illegal to have a sanctuary city back in 1996? It's been illegal for more than 20 years. They just didn't put any teeth into it. So a city can, can violate federal law, have a sanctuary city, and there's no penalty for them doing it. And you were mentioning how some of these uh, sanctuary cities are knowingly encouraging illegal immigration. There's another provision of our, our U.S. code that's been around for many decades. I think it's Title VIII, Section 1324, if I remember it correctly. And it says that it's a crime to harbor an illegal alien or to encourage an illegal alien to remain in or come to the United States or to induce an illegal alien to remain in or come to the United States. You think a few of our sanctuary cities might be breaking that law as well? Absolutely. Especially the ones that are giving benefits and giving the vote, like San Francisco is for, for public school uh, elections. That is encouraging people to stay in the United States. And so there are crimes. The laws actually already make it a crime to do so many things. But you have uh, unwillingness to enforce the law in some cases, and you have open disregard of the law. And, and that's why so many Americans, I think, are just fed up. 
that we've got to do something. That's why President Trump is our president right now. Let's not, let, let's not mince any words. <laughs> president, president Trump said a lot of great things, and he is an amazing speaker, and he, he compelled the American people with his, with his uh, charisma and his principle and his stands. But we all know. The number one thing that got him elected, that got him the, the, the votes of Ohioans, that got him the votes in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, was stopping illegal immigration and building the wall. That's why he's our president. So the time has come to start enforcing those laws. Before we go to the next question, uh, 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 Tom, I want to ask you, why is it so hard for the politicians? Why is it so hard for guys in Congress, and particularly Republicans, to take a hard line on immigration? Anytime that you see something like this where you go, I, I don't understand it. How can this be happening? I mean, most people in America want secure borders. Most people in America want, actually, the rule of law to be established. And you say, well, how is it that for all these years, we've never gotten that, even when most Americans really do want it? And, and there's an old adage, certainly in politics and in, in many things, and that is that whenever you're confused about why something's happening, follow the money. You know? and, and you will find... You will find that especially for Republicans, but not uniquely, but when you ask why are Republicans doing this, I will tell you. It's because of, of the money that's contributed to them through very substantial organizations, business, the business community, and the Chamber of Commerce. One of the biggest problems I ever had, and I always said there are two problems in Congress trying to deal with this issue. One's the Democrat Party that sees massive immigration, both legal and illegal, as a source of, of voters. You know, they're replenishing their voter pool. The other problem is the Republican Party, which looks at illegal immigration, both, I mean, immigration both legal and illegal, as a source of money. And that is exactly why you can't get these people to pay attention to it, because, in fact, money rules that roost, as you all probably know. But that's the reason. You know, uh, briefly here, Mr. Kovac is right. It's 8 U.S.C. 1324 that provides criminal penalties for people who are involved in the hiding or harboring of illegal aliens. You have university presidents that are involved in this. You have uh, people in major corporations that are involved in this. The mayor of Oakland recently, you may have heard this story, the mayor of Oakland tipped off people in her city that ICE was going to do raids. That is a direct violation of that uh, 8 U.S.C. 1324, but there's no will on the part of the Justice Department to charge any of these individuals. I said that if they just charged one person, one politician, one corporate leader, one university president under 8 U.S.C. Uh, 1324, you would see a lot of people back off. But they don't believe that the, that the United States has the will to enforce that law. As it relates to law enforcement, some of them are, are, are caught in the middle. All right, the guys, the men and women on the front line are just following orders. You have a chief uh, who who's sides with being a sanctuary city or a sheriff who sides with being a, a sanctuary county. The men and women on the front line, they can't do anything about that. But there is a way for you to put the pressure on these individuals. They know that you, at this point, you will not rise up. You've seen the polls. 60 to 70 percent of the people polled want something done about this broken Im illegal immigration system. But they won't do anything. But the politicians do not fear an uprising of the American people. So we have to build a critical mass of people to show them that we are going to push back. I think an effort like this start, it starts here, but it doesn't end here. Okay, and until the American people you can't do it through a poll, you can't do it through an op-ed, you can't do it in an interview on TV, we need a critical mass of people in the United States to say that's it. That's it to rise up and literally, literally, not metaphorically, push back against this government. If you have a question, go over to the line. Gentlemen, get one second before we do it. Tonight, I think the emergency declaration that the president is using that's going to reappropriate defense money or other monies to build the wall is now looks like it's going to be stopped 
by Republican votes. Go figure. I want to turn to Kobach for a second. Just very briefly, the emergency order, is it constitutional? Does the president have the rights to do this? And why do you think it is the Republican votes that are stopping him? Uh, yes, the president is acting within his constitutional authority. Uh, Congress passed this National Emergencies Act in 1976. Since the act was passed, there have been 58 national emergencies. Uh, you didn't. You think, wow, that's a big number. That's because nobody wrote about it because no one actually perceived that they were national emergencies. Of those 58, 31 are still in effect today. Um, did you know that there was a national emergency that I think President Bush declared uh, about Sudanese um, trade, trade, trade with Sudan? Did you know there was a national emergency uh, about a uh, Belarus about uh, voter fraud in the Belarus election? That was President Bush's. Um, there is a, a national emergency about a failed coup in Burundi. Did you know that? None of these things affected us. And, and so most Americans would say, well, that's not really a national emergency. But what President Trump is talking about, with thousands of Americans losing loved ones, thousands of Americans dying every year, hundreds of billions of dollars being spent out of our, our, our welfare state every year, that is a national emergency. It is, it is clearly within it. But, So the law is drafted so broadly that basically anything a president thinks is a national emergency is a national emergency within the act. But here we have one that truly is. And by the way, did you know that both President Clinton and President Obama declared national emergencies under that law concerning drug cartels in Mexico smuggling drugs into the United States? And those are still in effect. And so that's essentially what Trump is continuing. He's saying this is a national emergency for that reason uh, as well. Why Republicans are, uh, are not backing the president on this, I think they're kind of getting two different issues confused. They, a person could reasonably say, you know what, maybe the National Emergencies Act in 1976 was drafted too broad because we've, get pre we've got presidents declaring a, a, a failed coup in Burundi as a U.S. national emergency. And so they're, they're objecting to the terms of the act. But for anyone to say that President Trump, what he has described, is not a national emergency, is absolutely wrong. We've had previous presidents declare the same situation a national emergency. And so if they want to narrow the act and tailor the act so that only truly national emergencies like the one we're talking about right now are, are covered under the act, that's fine with me. But let's not confuse the two things because what President Trump has declared is a national emergency. Steve. 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 Yes. Steve. 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 I want to say something. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Steve and I, Ron Beck and I, attended a separation of the families at the border judicial hearing um, a week and a half ago in D.C. And what these politicians want to make into a national emergency is the two children who died in, in Border Patrol custody who came to the border sick, and that's all this judicial hearing was talking about. They were accusing Border Patrol agents of raping these children. They were refu refusing to even acknowledge that Steve, myself, and another angel mom were in the audience representing three dead Americans because if they acknowledged that we existed and if they acknowledged that our children were buried six feet underground, they would have to admit once and for all that there is a national emergency because they would have to acknowledge every American that has been killed. And they won't do that. Before, before President Trump came and, and, and brought the issue, of the angel moms and dads to, to, to part of the national conversation. Tell us what it was like when you went to Washington. How did politicians treat you before Trump made this part of the national dialogue? You know, it used to be that uh, politicians didn't really want to talk to us. When Grant was killed, I got a call from uh, Matt Salmon. I never heard from John McCain. I never heard from Jeff Flake. <laughs> Neither of us did. And, and some of that still goes on today. A lot of these politicians, Marianne and I actually went to D.C. early, and we tried to go visit some of these, these congressmen, congresswomen. And, um, you know, you start talking to their chief of staff, and once you, once you mention you're an angel family and your son or daughter's been killed, it's kind of like, oh, squirrel. They're already gone. They're, they're somewhere else. They don't want to hear it. But now we have a group of politicians, um, Andy Biggs, Jim Jordan, Paul Gosar, 
and the list goes, Steve King, and the list goes on and on, that they want to hear our stories and they want to talk to us, but the left, they still don't want to hear from us. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be anywhere part of it. It's like we have the plague because it doesn't fit their narrative. They don't want to hear about our permanent separation because they want to keep talking about the separation of families and children at the border and how horrendous it is. It, it's just a double standard. Well, and Trump tried to stop the separation at the border by holding them all there for asylum hearings at the border and Judge Tigar in the Ninth Circuit Court overturned him. And so now Border Patrol agents can only hold on to people for 20 days. They are bused to the interior of our country and they are released amongst us. And what, we're slated to have a million of them come out across our border this next this year? Phoenix is a hotbed. It's like the, the Greyhound station right there by the airport in Phoenix constantly has DHS buses arriving, just dumping these people off. Given a ticket to go somewhere else in the United States, 80% of them cut their ankle bracelets off, and more than that, never even show up for their asylum hearings. And they have all become yours and my responsibility now as taxpayers. I want to say one last thing about the emergency. Uh, the, 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 I think it's the Republicans today have offered, they're talking about offering President Trump a deal to let him have his, potentially have his border emergency, but he would have to sign legislation that he would not call for any other emergencies unless he got legislation passed, correct? I, I don't know what the, you never know what's actually going to be in the bill. I've heard a version of it that it's going to be uh, the new bill will have a narrower definition of an emergency and Congress would have to approve that it really is an emergency. It's to handcuff days. Trump. It would be to handcuff Trump and all future presidents. Ridiculous. So I'd like to say hi to Jim Hoff and the viewers at Gateway Pundit again. They're here. Um, one of their questions is, how does the panel feel about President Trump designating Mex Mexican cartels as terrorists? Darby? <laughs> yeah, so, so today um, a story came out on Breitbart. My colleagues and my editor wrote it, um, and they interviewed President Trump. And he said that he was uh, seriously considering designating Mexican cartels as foreign terrorist organizations. <laughs> now, another thing, another thing happened today also. Uh, Representative Chip Roy and uh, I believe it's Mark Green, Green uh, uh, they, they submitted a, a, a bill uh, to designate not the Mexican cartels as foreign terror organizations, but to designate specific Mexican cartels as foreign terror organizations. Now, the reason that matters is if, if you say we need to designate cartels as terror organizations, well, you, A, you're not going to get that done, and B, it's just you're going to weaken the definition of, uh, you're going to weaken the gravity uh, that comes from uh, designation as a foreign terrorist organization. However, there are specific Mexican cartels, three of which who operate on our border, right? Uh, specific factions of Mexican cartels who have crossed that line into actually deserving the designation. They're not only uh, pumping drugs into our country, all these things, okay. But what they've done is they've shifted to using sheer terror and acts of terrorism, attacks on media outlets, attacks on public officials, assassinations of public officials, attacks on citizens, attacks on uh, 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 places that tourists go, uh, in order to achieve and to hold political power, right? So when we go to the Losetas, Losetas when we go to the CDN faction of Los Zetas, the main dominant faction, they are using acts of terrorism to control every facet of life. They are using acts of terrorism to make sure that all the media outlets report to them and get permission before they, they report, to make sure that all the politicians are, are on board with what is it, is, it, is it a better thing to designate them as a foreign terrorist organization or not? It's a hundred percent better to designate the ones that deserve it. Okay, then why? Foreign terror or specifically, be quick. Just tell us why. Why is it better? What, what what happens different than today with law enforcement supposedly all over them? Right. So what? How does it stop this problem? Well, problem of the opioids and the fentanyl. How is designating these three subsets as terrorist organization? How does it keep her alive? Here, here's the chess on that. 
Here's the plan on that. If you designate these specific cartels who use sheer terror to control their regions as foreign terror organizations, you prevent the State Depart the U.S. State Department from playing softball with them for political reasons, for diplomatic reasons. You are able to better go after the money people behind the cartels, uh, the bankers, the U.S. banks in a lot of cases who take this money. You're able to go after these groups, and if you go after these groups and you make an example out of these groups, all of the sudden, other groups in Mexico, other cartels will get in. So, so you stop the money laundering, you stop the banks from working with them, you stop the politicians. What else, Chris? So the, the term foreign terrorist organization appears throughout the U.S. Code. So suddenly all of these other powers are triggered, and you can freeze the assets, and law enforcement agencies can do things they otherwise couldn't do if it's a foreign terrorist organization. So suddenly the whole legal landscape changes when you designate So this is a big deal. If Trump does this, this is a big deal. It's a big deal. Awesome. So we have Jim. Oh, oh, Jen, I just want to ask you a question for the gateway. How much time? How much time do we have? We're going past eight thirty. Uh, Dustin. Let's keep rolling. We'll get a couple more questions. Keep going. In, real quick. Jim from Cincinnati. Hi, I'm from also from Watch the Vote USA, and I want thank you, Mr. Bannon, Congressman Sheriff, all of you for all that you're doing. I want to ask a question about fighting back. Okay, but first one sentence. Your kind communications director took a color flyer for each of you to pass on, hopefully, to Trump and Jim Jordan on how to get an honest vote count in 2020. My question on fighting, thank you. My question on, my question on fighting back is this. I know you're doing a lot already, but has there been any consideration to expanding this project a little to tell the wonderful donors how to become Trump committeemen, precinct committeemen at the local level oh. to change the leadership of the Republican Party at the county level where need be and change the Congress to be pro-American and pro-wall. Oh, hold it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, second, hang on, sir. hang on. Grab him. Okay, real quickly, because we know we got a lot of guys like Dan Schultz and others in Arizona. They're all over this project. Real quickly, how can people in this audience become a local committeeman, a precinct man, no. to help change the narrative and help stop all the moderate Republicans that, that yes. fail to back the president and to back the guys like Kobach and, and Tancaro. And that's what we need. Here's what it is. is if you can do it anywhere in the country, but in Hamilton County, it'll be nearly the same in every county. You get five signatures, only five signatures in your local neighborhood. You can find out from the Board of Elections what your precinct is and then you run for precinct. One third of the offices are vacant, but if you have an opponent, it's whoever gets the most results. You go to a convention in downtown Cincinnati uh, in June like of next year, and you elect the party chairman. And if our, your party chairman in your county isn't a Trump person and an aggressive Trump person like these guys, you replace them, and then we get a Congress that'll back Trump. If you, if you want to fight back, that is at the lowest cost, most effective way to do it. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Jan, let's roll another question. We're burning daylight here. Jan? Yes. Sorry. Let's, go. let's Sorry, get a question. Sir. Here you go, sir. Uh, thank you. I'm yes, an honor to be here, and I drove six hours to get here from southern West Virginia. <laughs> and it, was, it was a good trip. Um, you, came, you came from West by God, Virginia, to be here? Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, we all know that the border wall needs to be done right now. We have to have it quickly. Um, I designed a product many years ago for flood prevention, and it can be adapted to a border wall. And you're with Ohio being the plastics capital of the world, uh, we make this, uh, this product out of composites, flame-proof, clear composites. I've been trying to contact you guys about it. Um, and that means jobs. You know, uh, one thing is our, our designs. Uh, Sir, I'm sorry, can I just... We have a lot of questions behind you, and everyone's been waiting. But hold it, but hold it. We want to sit down with you right afterwards, so we'll yeah, be here. You could just wait one second with me. I'll get your information. I just want to... We have five minutes with Gateway Pundit. Awesome. But just stay one second. We, we've what got, is your we name? We've got five minutes, so let's, let's do these quick. My name is Melba Gwynn, and I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, I, I'm so upset about the fact 
that, uh, you know, whatever we're doing here, we have got so much trash that it re supposedly representing us in Washington, how, and, and, and as this lady said, they should be responsible, Sherrod Brown and the rest of them, Nancy Pelosi and all of them, that when these things are happening and they come out and try and justify it and sit around and make up words like we're racist or whatever stupid things they come up with in order to deflect their behavior on us, that we should be able to go after them. They're supposed to represent us. Hang on for a second, hang on a second. Are you a committeeman? Okay, you're gonna see this guy right here. Seriously, if you wanna take it back, you know, we're a volunteer organization that Chris is leading. It's gonna do the wall and other things to get this movement going. But at the end of the day, it's citizen involvement. It's citizen involvement and volunteering and helping us. But the one thing you can do is what the gentleman just said. Just be a, a, just be a precinct man. If you be a precinct man, you start to take over the Republican Party. You take over the Republican Party, then you've got guys like Tancredo and Kobach that you can support and we can start to win again. Well, I, you know, I would just like to say... Um, you can take the trash out. Oh, God. <laughs> um, I, just like to I say, tell you what, let's get, we need one life. more question. Can you hand the mic to the uh, woman okay, in the back? I just want to say this. Yes, ma'am. Never in my life did I think I would like to see a d dictator. But if there's going to be one, I want it to be Trump. Okay, here you go, ma'am. You're from Loveland, Ohio? Yes. Hi. Deb Geo, Loveland, Ohio. And actually, I was a Central Committee member for four years, so it's very cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I understand the wall. Yes, I believe it is the um, government's responsibility to keep this country safe. That should be its top priority. And I understand that... we got to get to a question because we're burning daylight. However, I think the Hit crux me. of the situation Hit is... Me. Why is this country paying benefits for all of these people coming in when not one other country in this world allows benefits? They're, they're here for supposedly persecution, and yet they're able to fly their flag, but we can't fly ours. Uh, I want to know, Mr. Bannon, since you were with the administration for seven months, what is the government doing to stop paying people to have babies to come in and take advantage of our... So I'm, so I'm a goodness. punt to Kobach, but Kobach, let's go really quickly about the difference between political asylum and how they're trying to game the system on economic asylum. Okay, well, I'll address that last part about benefits. Well, guess what? In that same 1996 law, Congress said it's illegal to give public benefits to illegal aliens, whether they're federal or state. But guess what the state governments are doing? They're giving away the benefits anyway. Just about every, they're, they're ignoring federal law. And once again, the Congress didn't put any teeth in that law and say, if a state gives away federal benefits or gives away state benefits to illegal aliens, the Justice Department can sue them for doing X, Y, or Z. It's ridiculous. Our law is filled with so many things that are being violated right now. And the federal government is supposed to not be giving benefits to illegal aliens either. But of course, there's earned income tax credits and there are all kinds of other ways that money is being funneled uh, to illegal aliens. And we, the taxpayers, are paying for it, many of whom are competing in the same jobs against illegal aliens who, have to, who are competing and driving down wages in those same jobs. We have Bob. Well, we got one last question, and then we're going to have uh, uh, Brian wrap it up. Perfect. So we have Bob from Westchester, Ohio. Be quick. As a veteran, Brian, I'd like to thank you for what you're doing. Thank you. And Steve. I want to thank you for your leadership during the 2016 campaign and especially what you did after the Billy Bush tape when you made sense to Rance Priebus and uh, Paul Ryan. You saved the election. I believe that. Remember, we had the greatest candidate ever, so it was a pretty easy job. But thank you. And here's my question for uh, Tom Tancredo. Harry Truman, at the end of his life, was asked why he went into politics. He said, well, as a young man, I had two choices. I really wanted to be a piano player in a whorehouse, but I found politics easier. What can we do to keep the GOPs from playing piano in the whorehouse? Okay, what, one more. One more for the gentleman right. right there. We'll go for it. One more. I, had, I wanted to ask you if you had thought about marketing with Nick Sandman regarding their lawsuit. We could possibly have, it can't get any better than it, a, a 
part of it funded by CNN if they are victorious in their lawsuit. We could dedicate Covington. sections of it. Would we team up with, this is the young man from Covington, right? Yeah, and so what's the question again? Will we team up? Well, I think uh, marketing is one of the biggest limitations we have in getting the message out of getting things accomplished. And the marketing value of bringing Nick Salmon in if he was interested would be tremendous. And then the, the social explosive power of going viral would probably happen where you'd get the wall partially funded by... I, 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 love, I, love, I love any young man that's suing the opposition party, media, CNN, for a quarter of a billion dollars. <laughs> Brian, you want to wrap it up and, and talk to people about where it, well, by the way, is this just a pipe dream? Can this really happen? I mean, you've inspired us so much, but is this just, is this reality or not reality? Would we be at this stage where we're at today in this project this fast? I mean, we're moving faster than the government can act. And it's because we have these people up here and all of you guys and every other American who's donated to this project behind us. And it's happening. I mean, we're going to be digging that dirt, hopefully next month, breaking ground, building wall. It's happening. Anything else? Okay. Any, anybody else? Because we're going we're gonna to jump. I want to thank Jim Hoft uh, and the guys at Gateway Pundit and everybody in Cincinnati today for being here. Thank you so much. We're going to be here and hang out for a few minutes, answer some questions. Thank you very much, and thank Gateway Pundit. I dropped my phone down here. Oh. Oh. Yeah. yeah.